when you put a needle under the skin, that is not any normal function of a biological system. Oral vaccines are the normal function. And this becomes very critical because oral is using the tonsils for what their function was, creating an immune response, bypassing the tonsils. But you throw a monkey wrench into the system. Hi, this is Bruce Lipton, and you're listening to Green Planet FM. Kia ora, greetings, and welcome to Green Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch, and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent Green Planet Earth. Kia ora and welcome. I'm Lisa Eyre, and this is Green Planet FM. I have in the studio with me Dr. Bruce Lipton. Now, he's that lovely voice that you hear at the very beginning of the program. And it's really wonderful to have him in the studio. Not only is he in the country, in New Zealand, but he's in the studio. Welcome, Bruce. Lisa, thank you so very much. I'm so honoured to be here and have this opportunity to talk to uh, one of the most wonderful populations in the world because I'm a a resident and so honoured to be here and so rejoice in New Zealand. Oh, that's really wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. Well, we're going to really cover a very controversial topic today because we're going to talk about vaccinations and the immune system. And I'm absolutely fascinated with Bruce's view on this. But what you need to know is that Bruce is an expert in his field. He is a biologist. And I'm just going to ask you to tell us very, very briefly why you have the knowledge that we need to listen to. Well, it's one of those stories of being in the right place at the right time. And uh, let's put it back in the time. That was 50 years ago. I was uh, working at the University of Virginia in research uh, in cell biology. And my major advisor at the time was uh, a prestigious Dr. Erwin Konigsberg, who had developed cloning techniques. So we're talking about cell cloning back uh, 50 years ago. But more importantly, it wasn't just any cell. We were cloning stem cells. And why is that interesting? Because back 50 years ago, there there were probably only a handful of us in the entire world that even knew what a stem cell was. Now, today, of course, uh, stem cell is common language. But uh, let let me just give people what is a stem cell? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is simply this, is that a human body is not a single entity. When you look in the mirror and see yourself and you say, oh, there's a single organism, uh, that's an illusion. For the simple fact is the human body is made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. When I say the word Bruce, uh, that is a name for a community of 50 trillion cells. So you, you are a community of cells. Uh, And what's real interesting is that on a day-by-day basis, we lose hundreds of billions of cells every day. Just since we started talking, we've probably lost uh, several hundred million red blood cells. They die, and they have to be replaced. Skin cells are dying, they have to be replaced. In fact, the entire lining of the digestive tract from, from mouth to anus is replaced every three days. You're talking about a trillion cells. Well, the big question is, and with all these cells dying, where you know what's keeping us alive? And I go, stem cells. And I say, what are stem cells? Let's straighten that right out. A stem cell is an embryonic cell. And I say, well, why don't you call it an embryonic cell? And I said, because the moment you're born, you're not an embryo anymore. So we change the name to stem cells. So stem cells are embryonic cells in our bodies for as long as we live. Their function is to divide and replace the cells that are dying every day. So we lose hundreds of billions of cells, and every day stem cells create hundreds of billions of new ones. So that keeps us in a state of health. So uh, I was uh, at the University of Virginia cloning stem cells. So I put one embryonic cell in a Petri dish by itself, and it would divide every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one, then two, four, eight, sixteen, 16, and doubling, doubling. And after a week, 30,000 Uh, cells in the petri petri dish most important point there are 30,000 genetically identical cells because they all came from one parent 
Then I take those cells, and this is a research that changed my whole life and career. I would split up that population of genetically identical cells and put them into three different Petri dishes. And I changed the composition of the culture medium a little bit. That's what we grow cells in. And then you make it now, let's make it real. What is culture medium? It's a laboratory version of blood. So if I grow human cells, I look at the composition of human blood and then try to make a synthetic version called culture medium. If I grow mouse cells, I look at composition of mouse blood and and then make culture medium based on that. So culture medium is equivalent in blood. But since I'm synthesizing in a lab, I have an opportunity to change the composition of that synthesis a little bit. So I have three dishes with genetically identical cells, but I create three slightly different versions of culture medium with different chemistry, slightly different. And in one dish, the cells form muscle. And in one dish, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, the cells form fat cells. Well, what was so totally amazing about all this is at the very time I was teaching uh, students a concept called genetic determinism. Genetic determinism is what the public still believes in. Genes determine the character of our lives. So, oh, my goodness, if you have cancer running in your family, you say, oh, my goodness, I have genes for cancer or Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease and that these genes are going to control my life. So we were teaching that genes control things. We were teaching the belief that genes turn on and off. Well, this research that I was working on revealed that, no, the genes did not control the fate of the cells. It was the environment. When I changed the environment, uh, the cells had different uh, expressions, even though they were genetically identical. So it wasn't the genes making that difference. It was the environment. I said, yeah, but the environment is blood, (laughs) the equivalent of blood. And I go, why is it relevant? And, and, And the point was simply this. The whole belief that genes control life is totally false. There is no such thing as a gene turning on and a gene turning off. Genes are blueprints. They are absolutely just molecular blueprints to make the building blocks of the body called proteins. You say, well, why is it relevant? I go, blueprint. I go into a, a, an architect's office and, and let's say she's working on a blueprint and you ask her, you say, is your blueprint on or off? And she'll look at you like you're crazy. It's like, it's a blueprint. There's no on and off. And I go, precisely. Genes do not turn on and off. Genes are not what we talk about in in medicine as self-actualizing, meaning genes have no control over their own expression. And now what we know is, from what I learned 50 years ago, is now the leading edge of science. It's called epigenetics. You go, well, what does that mean? I say, well, almost everyone out here in the audience right now has been programmed with the belief of genetics. That's the belief that genes control. So you say genetic control meaning the character of your genes that you inherited, control your life. That belief is quite unfortunate because what it really represents to people is that you become a victim of your heredity, meaning I don't pick the genes as far as I know, and if I don't like the characteristics, I can't change the genes, and the genes presumably were turning on and off. When we teach people that belief, what we're doing is disempowering them. Because what we're saying is your life is not under your control. It's under the control of your heredity. And then you become a victim uh, because you say, well, I can't control that. Uh, And then all of a sudden, when people find themselves being a victim, they find themselves being powerless. I have no control. And when somebody finds themselves powerless, they look for a rescuer. Who's going to help me because I have no control? And then, of course, what steps in the the way is is the pharmaceutical industry that says, here we are. We have all the things to help you. And and then everybody takes all these drugs believing that they are not capable of taking care of themselves because the program is I'm a victim. What my research 50 years ago revealed that, no, the genes did not control the expression. It was the environment, uh, and specifically, in this case, the culture medium. And so you go, so what the heck does that have to do with me as a person in the audience right now? And and here's the the fun part. I call it the joke part, but it's most serious, and it's simply this. When you look in the mirror and you see yourself as a single entity, I say, no, that's an illusion. You're made out of 50 trillion cells, the cells being the living entities. And then, uh, so I... uh, I suggest this in the humorous way, that a human is a skin-covered Petri dish with 50 trillion cells inside. And it has the original culture medium, the original one, blood. And I say, it doesn't make a difference 
for the fate of the cell, whether it's in a plastic dish or a skin dish, it's still controlled by the environment culture medium. So in my human body, my blood is my culture medium. And then now we're coming to the final conclusion of my very short introduction, Lisa. (laughs) Uh, It basically says this. We uh, uh, synthesize the blood in our body and the brain is the chemist. And the brain adjusts the chemistry. And the chemistry is adjusted based on our perception of life. So, for example, if you open your eyes and you see someone you love, your brain releases some beautiful things into the culture medium blood, such as uh, dopamine, pleasure, vasopressin, uh, uh, a hormone that makes you more attractive to your partner to keep you in love, uh, oxytocin, uh, bonding to bond to your source of love. And most importantly, uh, growth hormone or somatostatin is released when a person experiences love. Uh, and I say, why is that relevant? Well, growth hormone gives us our health. That's why when, when people are in love, they say, oh, look how they glow. See how healthy they are. And I go, that, that's, not, that, that's not an accident. That is a consequence of a culture medium infused with some wonderful chemistry of love. But if I said the same person opens their eyes and sees something that scares them, then those love chemicals are not released into the culture medium blood, but stress hormones are released into the blood, and, and elements that affect the immune system are released into the blood as we get into a protection mode. And it changes the behavior completely of what's going on. So what's the co- conclusion? is very simple. How you perceive life is translated by the brain into chemistry that goes into the blood, the culture medium, that controls the genetics of 50 trillion cells. So, so, Bruce, yes. you, you wrote a book called The Biology of Belief, and that's where people can find out more if you're very interested in that. It's quite scientific. Oh, but, it, it it, it, but it's it. very readable by a lay audience. Uh, uh, that was the hard part was when I first uh, left the, the laboratory research and tried to write a book, and I remember giving my first copy of a manuscript to some friends, and I said, well, tell me what you think about this, and, and then I couldn't find them. I had to go track them down. I, said, I finally got them. I said, well, well, tell me what you think about it. And they said, well, to be honest, Bruce, we didn't understand a word of what you just said in that book, uh, and they were avoiding me because they didn't want to tell me, but what was the point? Is like, well, there's a scientific language, and if you write in that, it's very restricted to people who are scientists and i realized no no this is not adequate to write a book for the public so it took a bit of time to translate it and i'm very happy the book is uh uh just got the 10th anniversary edition just came out last year uh it's still a best-selling book over 10 years why because it the public can understand it and and to me why is it so important because it takes us out of the program that most of us came from, that we are victims and that we are powerless in controlling our lives. And the fact is the farthest thing from the truth. You are controlling every aspect of your life by your consciousness and your belief, your perceptions. And when you change your belief or your perception, uh, you, you change your life dramatically. I mean, uh, most people go, oh, that sounds kind of new agey. And I go, listen placebo effect has been around for a hundred years. And what is the placebo effect? Well, I give you this pill, tell you this is the special medicine that's going to cure you. You take the pill, you get better, and everybody goes, oh, that pill was great, and then you find out it was a sugar pill. I say, so what healed you? Not the sugar pill, your belief in the sugar pill. And that is a fundamental understanding that's been known for almost a hundred years, but it is foundational to everything in the new biology. What we perceive What we believe is translated into chemistry by the brain that goes into the blood, the culture medium. And as the research revealed 50 years ago, it's the composition of the culture medium that determines the genetic activity. Change your belief, change the culture medium. Simple as that. So in society today, we think that we are victims to all these nasty germs that come zooming around and they're going to get us or they're going to get our children. So therefore, we think, well, what can we do to prevent it? And I suppose the pharmaceutical companies have had a great time uh, thinking about how to prevent things. And, I mean, I like the idea of prevention, but there's some things wrong with vaccines. Oh, my goodness, there's something major wrong with vaccines the idea of prevention and let's put it this way um there are people living on this planet for a hundred thousand years before medical schools got here and they lived and they thrived and they survived and some died of course you know of some illnesses and disease but 
how do people live for 100,000 years without a vaccine? And the answer is because when you understand the nature of the, the immune system in biology is we manufacture our own vaccines. Uh, uh, and so we have antibodies that are built into the system. And, and then, you know, medicine comes along and goes, well, let me help you. By, you know, injecting some some germ pieces in you uh, in a vaccine uh, and this will support your immune system. Well, there's so many things wrong with that statement. I, I have a hard time, Lisa, saying where, where do I begin? Uh, let me start with number one because people don't even understand this. The immune system is not developed at the time of birth. It is in process that the maturation of the immune system takes somewhere up to two years or more before it's actually functioning in its full operation. Uh, And this is why it is so important that uh, mothers know uh, about breastfeeding. And there's a very important reason. Yes, the nutrition that comes from breast milk is superior to any synthetic version made anywhere by any laboratory. Human breast milk is evolution's epitome of energy in a, in a bottle. And, and I said, well, yeah, so great. Um, this is really important. Uh, it has so many lipids, for example, that you can't get in conventional formula stuff. Uh, and you say, well, lipids, fat? I go, yeah. The brain, if you look at it in, a, in an autopsy, is white. It's white because it's almost all lipids and fat. And so in a developing child, the brain is what develops first and fast. It takes a, a few years to get it up to almost adult size by three or four years old. Uh, tremendous lipids. There's no substitute for creating a better brain than natural mother's milk. But here's the other thing. Mother's milk contains antibodies. And the antibodies that she has created to protect herself in the environment that she lives is passed on. It's called passive immunity, meaning it's not made by the baby, but it is used by the baby. So when the baby is taking in breast milk, it's not just getting nutrition, it's getting immune coverage. Why? The immune system isn't fully kicked in until two or three, so the mother is facilitating the health of the child with with this. So uh, a child gets antibodies via this mother's milk, so fine. Uh, then I say, but what about um, the, the way we do vaccines, injecting uh, uh, chemistry under the skin? I go, oh, my God. Then all of a sudden I have to say this is where the sanctity of a human body is broken. Because our understanding is, oh, that we must help the body. There's just like this conventional belief of the body is so frail and it's so vulnerable and, uh, and that we have to help it. And the fact is this is not true at all. Bodies are beyond belief in what they can do. You want to walk across hot coals, you can, you can walk across hot coals, but you have to have a mindset to do that. Uh, uh, and even just healing yourself, the placebo is a, a mindset. It has nothing to do with chemistry and all that. It's mindset. I go, so here's where the problem comes from. We have already, through the evolution of humans, created a natural immune system with a natural vaccination process. Immune people are here and healthy even if they've never seen a doctor in their lives. And they have all the antibodies and everything. You say, well, how did you get these antibodies without being vaccinated? And I go, because... There is a natural vaccination system that we have overlooked. And it's quite obvious to parents, especially of infants, very young, young infants, and that is this. It is a natural instinct for a child to put everything in its environment into its mouth. Everything. From, from its foot and its hands and to the nappy, uh, anything that's in there is really important because why is it relevant? It is a vaccination process. It is a natural vaccination process. I said, what do you mean vaccination? I didn't put it under the skin. I go, no, because there's something in the throat called tonsils. There's actually three pairs of tonsils, two above the hard palate in your mouth. These are pharyngeal tonsils, two at the back of your throat, which are the adenoid tonsils, and two down at the base of where your tongue connects called the sublingual tonsils. If you look in the textbooks today and you say, what about tonsils? What are they? And they go, oh, those are protection devices. And then, you know, if they get inflamed, then it's like, oh, okay, just take the tonsils out. No problem. Uh, They're just there for protection. That is the story. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. It's completely false. That's a misunderstanding. And I say, what do you mean? I say, 
tonsils aren't there to protect. In fact, here's a, a very important point. Tonsils are open to the digestive tract, to the throat, meaning there are channels, canals that open the tonsils to the stuff going down the throat. You go, well, if it was for protection, you would think I would close off any openings. But I say, no, the tonsils invite a sample of whatever goes through your throat to go in, and this is a learning center. This is where the system learns about what's in its environment. Everything you've ever eaten, anything you've ever swallowed, anything that you put in your mouth gets sampled by tonsils. Now, why is this relevant? Because the tonsils are the site of where immune system is evolving and developing. Whatever came in is uh, sampled by the immune system in the tonsil, and this can generate a whole series of immune cells to make antibodies against something. Or, but there's some very positive things that come in too. So the tonsils are, you know, we always look at it and say, oh, that's protection against negative stuff. I go, no, tonsils are learning your environment. They are actually a part of the nervous system. And they are, what do they do? They read the chemistry of the world in which we live. And I say, well, how does the body know the chemistry of the world? I go right back to that infant is instinctively drawn to put everything in their world into their mouth. And I say, well, this is how the body knows, like, what composition is in the food? What relevance is that composition to the human body? So anytime you eat something brand new that you've never eaten before... The body is on a 24-hour alert. The tonsils have taken in a sample. And for 24 hours, they look to see if anything changes in the body to correlate a physiological change with what you just ate that you never had before. But the body analyzes what you just ate. So, for example, um, let's say the body needs potassium. I say, well, how does the body tell you you need potassium? The answer is it will give you urgings like, oh, I feel like having a banana. It just popped out of your head. I, I, I was just walking down the street, and I feel like having a banana. And I go, that was not an accident. That is an understanding of the system. It says, where do I get potassium, and especially if it's something I like? And all of a sudden, a thought comes in to eat a banana. Children will eat soil. They'll eat dirt. And you go, oh, my God, they're eating dirt. Why are they eating dirt? And the answer is, the system has recognized in these individuals there's not enough mineral. And that eating the dirt provides the mineral. So we have to recognize there's this intelligence beyond anything that we have given credit to because we just said, oh, that's just a a little protection device, tonsils. Uh, And it's interesting because tonsils are very well developed until around puberty. And then tonsils start to undergo uh, a, a reduction in size and function. And you go, why would they... Why would these very valuable elements, tonsils, undergo this involution? That's the word. Uh, And the answer is simply this. In normal evolution of humans, by the time you're a puberty, you've tasted everything in your environment. and, And those people never left within 20 or 30 miles of their environment. So once by your 12 years old, your system has an awareness of everything in your environment, the pathogens as well as the nutritional elements and everything. It's, it's an intelligence. The problem is then once we started developing transportation systems and people started to move away from their home, they started to run into some challenges because they would be confronting a, a, new, a, a new toxin or a new element uh, and the immune system really isn't prepared to be overwhelmed with a lot of stuff after puberty because it's, it's already reduced its function. So let's go back to an understanding. Today's understanding of vaccines is I take a needle and a syringe and I inject this stuff under your skin. And then presumably the immune system is going to find this stuff. And then the immune system is going to make a response. That's the intention. Here's the problem. The biology was designed already to read the environment. You bypass the environment. You bypass the centuries that are observing what's going on in your world, your diet, what you're taking into your body. When you put a needle under the skin, that is not any normal function of a biological system. Oral vaccines are the normal function. And this becomes very critical because oral is using the tonsils for what their function was, creating an immune response. Bypassing the tonsils, you've just created, you've thrown a monkey wrench into the system. And bypassing the tonsils, even before the infant's 
system is mature also throws a monkey wrench in the development of the system. You're overwhelming the system with antigens that sneaked in, according to the body's awareness. Where the heck did that come from? Because it has no awareness of where it came from. It throws a a, a finely tuned machine. A human body is, is a superbly tuned machine with intelligence beyond anything. It, beyond even what humans can do because there's technologies in our bodies that humans can't even uh, come near producing today. Uh, the intelligence system is way beyond us. And, you know, we have a lot of human hubris. Uh, humans are smart and everything less than human is not so smart. And as you go down to lower and lower animals, go, oh, no, they're stupid and less and then there's no intelligence. You get down to the level of the cell and you go, oh, my God, how can there be intelligence in an amoeba? Uh, And then I have to then remind people that uh, 50 trillion amoebas created us. And with all the technology that's in our body came from cells. And so before we look down our noses at these cells, we must recognize they preceded us and their intelligence created us. So I wouldn't really try to challenge their intelligence, which medicine does, because it came from a belief that a body is not very intelligent and that we need you know, physicians to, you know, compensate for the lack of intelligence of the system. Uh, uh, And when it comes to vaccines, you bypass the intelligence. What do you expect to happen? And the answer is catastrophic, actually, uh, on a general population. Uh, You've overloaded an infant with so many different toxins and inject them uh, under the skin and bypass every normal route of entry that the system is designed and intelligence to be aware of. And then you expect your intervention to be very helpful when you violate the whole mechanism of intelligence uh, and therefore we're finding that um, with more and more vaccines, the health care crisis is getting worse and worse. <laughs> so yes. it's like uh, throw money at something was the idea. You put more money in it, it gets better. And it's like, no, with the amount of money in the health care system, health care crisis on this planet is worse than ever before. So um, we, we, it's time for public to question a belief that we've been programmed with. Well, I mean... If people want to have vaccines, we can demand, in a way, that they're done like the old polio vaccines that, um, well, we had on a lump of sugar, and I think my children just had a little drop on the tongue. But, I mean, surely, uh, I mean, I don't understand why the pharmaceutical companies would want to inject them, which hurts kids, under the skin, uh, when it can be a drop on the tongue. Uh, It's a very unfortunate situation. Having been a medical school researcher, having been funded by the National Institute of Health and the Muscular Dystrophy Association and having grants and grants and grants until I left the university, uh, I have to acknowledge something very important, that the grants are manipulations of research. (laughs) Yeah, I'll give you money if you do this research and I won't give you money if you do that research. Uh, And then the question is, is the pharmaceutical industry interested really in healing us and now i have to give it from my professional point of view and as just a citizen of the world number one it's all based on corporations they're healthcare corporations pharmaceutical corporations and i go well let's recognize the most important fact legally a corporation the number one rule of a corporation is that the organization is designed to make a profit for the shareholders So I say if any organization does something and doesn't make a profit, then that organization could go to court because the shareholders say you're not supporting who we are. Then I tell you this because I have much, 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 much experience with so many former recovering pharmaceutical people who worked in the industry who were doing some brilliant research, finding some wonderful kinds of drugs that were quite useful, and then realizing that they're – people above them in the chain of command would say thank you for your research and then they'd never see it show up in the daylight anything they did upon pursuing what happened to this marvelous drug that these researchers were working on it turns out it was not in the interest of the pharmaceutical company to sell this drug because they were making more money on a less effective drug and that if you give the effective drug, then you're going to lose the customer because if they get healed, then why would they come back and buy the drug? And so there's a history of pharmaceutical companies locking away 
very effective drugs and agents because they interfere with the profit motive of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and I have this from direct people who were executives in that industry. This is uh, not new. Uh, a, a, another interesting fact is a pharmaceutical company interested in the health of the world. Well, here's an interesting story that's true is when they develop a new drug, of course, they test the drug, and then there are side effects, and then people get hurt, and people can die. And then you think, well, if people die from your drug, then maybe this wouldn't be a good idea to pursue. And here's the true story. Drug companies do the metrics on it. They measure how many people are going to get sick, how many are going to die, how many are going to sue the drug company. Then they do the final the final number. If Can we make more profit selling the drug and still pay off the lawsuits. And they recognize the simple truth. If they can sell more drugs than they have to pay out for lawsuits, they'll market a drug knowing how many people are going to die from this drug with the understanding to them it's like, well, that's just how much money they have to pay back out. And so, again, please do not get in the, in the fantasy vision that a pharmaceutical industry is interested in taking care of your health. By law, it's interested in taking care of the shareholders. People are down the list. And the point is, how far down the list? Well, if the drug kills more people than they're going to make money, then they, they probably won't market that drug. It's absolutely shocking. But, of course, it's how big business, well, how all business works, is that you have to financially survive first. But there's somehow in the society some idea that um, the medical profession and, and the pharmaceutical companies uh, are actually God, you know, they're the ones that are going to take care of you and of course it isn't like that as you've just explained. This is Green Planet FM and I'm Lisa Eyre and I'm interviewing scientist Dr Bruce Lipton who is a biologist and a researcher and university lecturer. Now Bruce, back to the medical system. Well, I just want to I want to clear the medical doctors because I used, I was a professor in a medical school <laughs> and I was teaching all this kind of stuff to doctors. And I have to acknowledge uh, doctors are not given a full education. They're given a limited education by uh, determine what's in that field of study by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, is there such a thing as energy healing? My God, energy healing was here before there was pharmaceutical healing. Does it work? My God, yes, it does work. Why aren't we using it? No profit motive. There's nothing. If we could sell energy in a tablet or a pill, I can assure you today the pharmaceutical industry will have bottles of these pills and tablets in every store everywhere. But energy is not a commodity you can put into a chemistry. And therefore, the idea of energy healing is dismissed, not by the public, but by the corporate entities that dissuade us from why seek a a healing that doesn't involve buying a drug. Yes, it's very sad, isn't it? So, going back to the vaccines, they're not giving them to us via the tonsils. They're sticking them into the skin because they're less effective and then you're going to have to go back and get more things done, essentially. Well, it was uh, it was way, way back when the cowpox days, uh, when they recognised that uh, milkmaids that worked with cows with cowpox wouldn't uh, get smallpox. And they said, well, how? Well, because they were handling the udders and, uh, uh, and doing the milking and that it got into their skin and some anywhere there's a little wound or something. And they, that's when Jenner back in those days said, wait, what if we just take the cowpox and just put it right into the wound? And all of a sudden, uh, these people were now protected from smallpox. Well, day one, it says, oh, you, all you have to do is put the stuff in the wound. Uh, and then day two is, well, how about the syringe? We just stick it in underneath. And I go, this is really cool, except you have still not understood the nature of tonsils because in biology and medicine, they've been pushed aside as uh, like a lymph node, which is a protection device, as to be equivalent of a lymph node without recognizing, my God, it's the intelligence of the system and you're bypassing this and the result of any intelligent system that gets bypassed and gets hacked, that's hacking, uh, uh, will disrupt the system. So that's interesting, um, finding out that that's how it started going in the skin through the cowpox. That's um, I didn't know that one. That's well, that, really that's the original. That's the original vaccination. So they then they would scratch somebody's arm till they get an open wound, 
and then they would take uh, like the cowpox, fa- uh, the cowpox, bleh, that stuff from the cowpox, and rub it into the wound, and that would then provide the 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 you know protection against the smallpox. Well, yeah, that's that's really interesting, and it did work and all that. But then they made just that was a generalization. Oh, you want to put something in? You put it in under the skin. We don't have to scratch the skin anymore. Now we just take a very nice, clean hypodermic needle and then put toxins in under the skin. But doing it the cowpox way, it went directly into the bloodstream. Doing it in the injection, it's probably going into fat or various levels depending on how far the needle's put in. Well, it's just simply, it's wherever they stick it, that was not a destination of learning. Yes. So then you have to bring cells in from other places. And, and of course, if you were a cell in the body, and cells are like miniature people, they, all the functions of a human are present in almost every nucleated cell. Uh, so imagine you're in a community of cells, and all of a sudden some, some toxin shows up in your community. Uh, uh, it's an emergency situation, and you try to deal with it at that emergency level. Uh, so in other words, if the toxin went in orally... Then the tonsils would have recognized, oh, okay, this is a toxin, and this is how we counteract the toxin. We make an antibody, we make an immune response, uh, and that way, if the toxin comes in in any other way, through a splinter or a cut or anything that got open, the immune system is already prepared to deal with it. But if you just stick the toxin in and the immune system regulations, the tonsils, are not involved... Uh, then you're going to try and take, uh, you know, if you're in the neighborhood, you go, where the heck did that stuff come from? Because you, you don't know about a needle. And all of a sudden there's this pile of toxin in your neighborhood and you're looking around going, where did that come from? The immune system is like, where the heck did that come from? The immune system has sentries watching all the ports of entry. Uh, you're confusing an intelligent system. And we have to recognize that the body is an intelligent system. And our intelligence is not as intelligent as the body's intelligence. Uh, And when we get that hubris and we say, we know how to control this, we know how to do this, inevitably human technology will foul up the system. Yes. Well, hopefully one day it won't. Well, it's uh, just becoming aware. If there's a natural way to inoculate ourselves and nature's been doing that for 100,000 years, maybe we should, you know, work with nature and do the same thing. Uh, uh, and the idea of putting all these uh, uh, vaccines in is like, who benefits from this? Well, I can tell you who benefits from this. this is the pharmaceutical company. They get tremendous amount of government money to free because they're making people do this. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, this is a, a violation of human rights and my perception as a biologist that some government decides that they can put something under my skin. I, I have an intact system. I have a closed system. It doesn't, it doesn't let anything in without recognition and control. And that when legally somebody says, I can inject you with toxins and with what are called the adjuvants, which are the uh, adjuvants are added with whatever, uh, you, let's say we want to make a, a, you know, an antibody against a certain virus. So you break that virus up into pieces so that you've got pieces of the virus the immune system can recognize. But when you inject it under the skin, like I said, number one, this is the wrong place to engage in immune response. So you really want to excite the immune system to deal with that. So you put something in called an adjuvant. An adjuvant is an irritant. <laughs> and they're often think horrible things like um, aluminium and um, mercury, uh, which you don't really want in the body. And if you have a whole pile of injections, as children do over their lifetime, um, you get too much of this stuff in, in your body. It's, it's toxic. Mercury is poison. I mean, when I was a kid, we used to play with it. It was kind of fun. But then as you get a little older and all of a sudden the reality is, oh, my God, mercury is poison. And then all of a sudden we can't touch this poison. I say, you can't touch it, but you're going to put it in an injection and put it underneath the skin of someone. I got, we already know it's poison. Why the hell would you do this? Because it's not the adequate way to engage the immune system by putting something under the skin. But if you add the adjuvant, it creates such a shocking system that it really focuses the immune system to start dealing with it. Yeah, but you are now creating uh, an emergency, not with the, 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 the virus that you want to make an antibody against, but with the adjuvant that was to bring in all of these immune cells. I say, you don't need to do this. The system is already ready to sample your virus if you just break it down and swallow it. 
uh, and, and this is a way of dealing with even hypersensitivity to allergies, which is an immune response. How do you deal with it? You take small samples of that allergen and swallow it. And over time of swallowing small samples, the immune system will build up an immunity to that allergen. And I said, wow, that, that, that's using the oral system already. That's, that's how you get rid of hypersensitivity. I go, that is the basic way. And vaccines are the cheap, fast, let me just put it under your skin, get out of here uh, way. And I go, on a piece of paper, it sounds good. But if you start to put all the negative aspects of violating a system, uh, then it becomes toxic. And, of course, what they're doing with children is because they say, well, you know, parents won't necessarily keep coming back to the doctors to give them one at a time. They're giving them to them in bulk. So my wee grandson, who's 15 months old, is due to have... MMR, that's measles, mumps and rubella in one arm, chicken pox in another arm and two different illnesses that I have never heard of, so I'm sure he doesn't need vaccinating against, in his thighs. So it's actually six different vaccines about to be put into his system. Which is immature. Yes, as a, as a little wee boy and um, I heard of another child recently who was terribly ill after that and of course after a while maybe the, the medical professional realised that that's actually not a good idea to give so many at the same time because one thing that happened here and this has stopped happening now in New Zealand is the hepatitis B vaccine was being given to newborn babies before they left the hospital and they tried to give it to my younger son when he was three hours old and I had to argue for half an hour with the nurse to stop it from happening. And he'd just come out of a sterile environment, was dealing with all the bacteria in our world and they were going to stick something else in him as well. And to me, uh, it, it, I, I wasn't anti-vaccine or anything, but I just said this is insanity. So how the medical profession give us these vaccines is also in my opinion a major problem what do you think bruce well uh, the, the whole idea is who's who's justifying this and who's giving the go ahead on this and we get something like uh uh, the Center for Disease Control, CDC in, in the U.S., uh, which, again, very interesting because on the way in this morning to do this, I also just saw an article that showed that a new hepatitis B version vaccine was introduced, voted on. They had the uh, meeting uh, on video, uh, and the first thing that people said, well, we haven't tested this for safety, and yet 100% of the vote acknowledged that this is going to, you know, to use this vaccine. I go... My God, they, they, the first thing they said, we haven't tested this, uh, uh, and yet it's now approved. And I go, something is underneath here, and it's really the long-arm manipulation of pharmaceutical money, gifts, donations, whatever the heck you want to call it, that favors their, their, their stuff. And this is quite unfortunate as a biologist and a person who is now wise enough to have stepped out of the medical system. Why? Uh, because, look. I'm not going to make this up. This is a fact of life. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, an article by Dr. Barbara Starfield revealed using, and I emphasize, conservative estimates, uh, revealed that medicine is the third leading cause of death in the United States uh, via something called iatrogenic illness. Iatrogenic illness is a, a patient with problem A goes to the doctor, gets a treatment, and then dies from problem B, which is the result of the treatment. <laughs> and so iatrogenic illness is the third leading cause of death with conservative estimates. And uh, there, there's an article on the web called Death by Medicine, which uh, Gary Null and a group of doctors got together and said, don't give us the estimates. Give us the numbers. So they compiled all the numbers. And uh, rather than the self-claimed third cause of death, and when medicine claims that it is the third cause of death, third leading cause of death, even that alone alone should should get people like oh my god the health profession's third leading cause of death maybe something's wrong here uh, uh and uh medicine does really really wonderful miracles with trauma you know if i break my bone i don't want a chiropractor and i don't want a massage therapist or homeopathy i want a medical doctor if i'm in an accident in a car and my guts are hanging out again a massage therapist is not really my destination <laughs> but the problem is what about diseases cancer diabetes 
cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's. All of these are not served by our conventional medical treatments. In fact, uh, it's kind of toxic for most of them. Uh, And that we're beginning to find out that um, a lack of understanding and then a pursuit of pharmaceutical interests to make money off of this uh, is really the source of the problem. So uh, medical doctors get blamed because they're in the middle. But as a medical school professor, I can assure you that if we didn't give them the correct information in medical school, then how do we expect them to practice to the highest level of their ability? And I know that uh, the whole story of genes uh, has been a fallacious argument ever since 1953. Uh, the idea that genes turn on, on and off and control life, this is a total false understanding it's we control our genes by how we perceive the world. And going back to that medical school, um, I presume that the medical schools are funded by the pharmaceutical companies in many respects. Good presumption. As a matter of fact, it's probably an underestimate presumption. It is primarily shaped, the, the, the standard medical practice is primarily shaped by um, the pharmaceutical companies. Interesting because if you look at the CDC in the United States and people started looking at it and finding out, oh, my God, many of the members of the CDC were employees of pharmaceutical companies. And all of a sudden you see, oh, well, there's no separation of the corporate interest from the health interest. And that is where the problem comes from. It's where the problem comes from in many things, isn't it? Such as the industrial military machine and uh, what the foreign policy is of America. <laughs> well, and- I, I, I'm, I'm living in a country, and you know, listen, I, I am honored to be a resident of New Zealand. I think it's, a, I call it my get out of jail free card uh, <laughs> uh, because there's, there, there's an evolution going on in this planet. Uh, every country is facing some kind of upheaval, uh, political, religious, whatever is going on. Uh, uh, and this is not an accident or, or coincidence. It's because um, we're facing extinction. Uh, uh, five times in the history of the planet, there's something called a mass extinction wiped out from 70 to 90 percent of all life. Five times. Uh, the last one, the dinosaurs got lost. It was a, a comet that hit the planet and upended the environment. Today, science has recognized we are already in the sixth mass extinction, uh, and the cause, and this is where the, where the trouble is, the cause is human behavior. The way we manage the ecosystem, the way we're undermining uh, the, the plants and animals of this world, they're undermining our own health, the way we're destroying the environment in so many different ways. Uh, we've, they took a survey of how many animals were on the planet in 1970, and they just recently redid it, and 62% of the population is gone. We're down to one-third of the animals that were here in 1970. And that fish, 90% of the fish of the ocean are gone with a destination of 2048 as a date when there will be no fish in the ocean on planet Earth because of overfishing, pollution of the water, altering the breeding grounds, etc. Humans are doing this. So what we're seeing is a planetary upheaval. People are beginning to recognize the things that we bought into as our saviors, the medical profession, the pharmaceutical industry, cancer. Oh, my God, those people, that industry. uh, They're not improving the situation. As a matter of fact, they're making everything worse. So upheaval is in the air. And and, and what's so wonderful about New Zealand, because if I come from the U.S. as I do and tell you, the government in the U.S. Doesn't, uh, isn't uh, supporting the population. It supports the corporation. Uh, a, a simple point, slap in the face, is they ask uh, Americans, how many of you want to have background checks on guns? 95%. And the government voted against it. And it's like, well, who's the government supporting? If 95% of the people wanted it, it turns out the, the corporate lobby. Uh, and it's interesting because here in New Zealand, you got, yes, you do have the Dairy Corp, which wields big power, but it's not like the U.S. where every corporation wields power, so people are just at the mercy of corporate desires, money, profit. Uh, uh, And and it's failing, and that's why um, I'm very happy to sit over here in New Zealand and watch what's happening uh, to the U.S. because we cannot build a sustainable society on the current way governments are working because that's where the problem comes from. And so a collapse, which we're experiencing globally is necessary to rebuild a civilization that lives in harmony with the planet and in harmony with our own biology. 
and the, yes, and nature. Well, I, I like your idea of New Zealand, but considering this current government has just signed the CPTPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, I think it'll take us very much more into the way that things have been done in uh, in the US as opposed to away from them. But this is not what the interview is about. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, uh, yes, I, I wish there was uh, some way that we could, we could stop all of this happening that people can't look at the US and say, hey, this is not the direction we should be going in. That, that always surprises me because, uh, for example, uh, just one of the things that, that is a little upsetting is that in the US we have private prisons. It's corporate. I said, well, yeah, corporations are the, the first design is make a profit. I said, well, if you run a prison, how do you make a profit? And the answer is how many prisoners can you get? And, and all of a sudden you start to realize, look how many prisoners that the U.S. has in, in prison these days. Why? It fulfills the corporate interest of, of making a prison a profitable investment. Uh, and then I see that, oh, my God, New Zealand has private prisons. I thought, take a look at the result of this. In the U.S., the prison money was paying judges under the table to give jail sentences to fill up the rooms. Uh, And I say, and it's no different with hospital corporations who have empty rooms and and are suggesting things that to me are, oh, my God, such as um, uh, in a birthing situation, OBGYNs are offering women a cesarean in place of natural childbirth uh, by saying, hey, there's no difference between the two and you can save all the pain. And guess what? We have all the empty rooms here in the hospital. So come on in, do your do your cesarean. It's like a cesarean totally compromises the, the uh, psychology of a developing baby. It's part of the evolution to go through a birth process. If you bypass that, there are consequences that show up later in life that uh, that are very important. And, and occasionally you can't help but having to have one. Oh, but... That is a health issue, but not yeah. a given, like, an alternative to normal. Yes. This is, there is a... Normal is normal. It's been that way for a million years. <laughs> the idea that you think that humans are smarter than nature, that's where we always get into problem. Yes, I think that I, I like that way of, of looking at things, Bruce, that... We do assume that we are superior to nature, that we know more than nature. And it probably came from Genesis where it was said that, um, you know, man would be in charge of the Dominion animals. over. That's the, that's the phrase, Dominion yes. over. Oh, I, I see we were getting shorter on time, but I just wanted to add something I thought that is really important because it's related to the immunology stuff that we're talking about. First thing that people have to know is this. There's a to have a baby has to compromise the immune system of the mother for a simple reason. The placenta invades the the uterine lining, the endometrium, but the placenta is foreign cells, yes. and the mother has a different identity. The immune system is to eliminate all foreign cells, and so the idea that a placenta can implant in a mother and stay in there is like was perplexing for the longest time how can the mother's immune system tolerate foreign cells well we now know something new there's something called exosomes uh, which are viruses made by our own cells and that these exosomes um, are released by the fetal cells and what do they do they change the function of the immune system in the area of the placenta so that the immune system, upon receiving these viruses, will no longer attack the the fetal tissues, which allows the placenta to grow. It redirects the immune system. And I say, but here's the important point about it. The important point about it is in redirecting the immune system, it changes the focus of the immune system to deal with parasites and not with cells like cancer cells, which is like uh, growing a a, a placenta with foreign cells. It's like having a cancer in a sense. Uh, And I say, well, so it redirects it toward parasites. Well, this is really critical. That phase, so the blood of the fetus is uh, uh, filled with these what are called helper cells that help the immune system. But these helper cells are redirecting the immune system to deal with parasites and not deal with conventional antigens. And in order to get the system back on, the baby is required to have an infection. 
because the infection then will cause the immune system to go back into the original version. Uh, the helper cells are called one and two. Helper cell one is the one that makes normal immune response. Helper cell two it takes us toward parasites. If the child does not get an infection early on, then when antigens such as like peanut allergies and things that are not toxic to most people, if the baby is exposed to these before the system can switch back to A, to T, T helper cell one, uh, the, it results in what, what is called uh, sensitization, uh, allergic responses, hypersensitivity. That if the baby shifts back to the normal immune system with T helper cells one, those things don't cause allergies. So when you see the allergies rising in today's world, we now understand why. And this is why I need to add this before we close. A child is required to have an infection. And we, there's something called the hygiene hypothesis, which says that we sterilize and we clean everything so much to the, you know, for around these infants that it doesn't kick the system back into T helper cell one early enough. And therefore, when a child gets exposed to things that are not normally toxic, but in their, in their parasite T helper two phase, it causes an allergic response instead of a normal response. So when we see allergies and hypersensitivities increasing in the population, it's a reflection upon the fact that a child is not getting the early infections necessary to return it back to conventional T helper cell 1. Uh, and it's a very interesting fact that the healthiest kids are the ones that have pets in the family. And the reason is simply this. You might put Lysol on everything else, but you don't wash your cat and your dog with Lysol. They become inoculators of the infection that brings the health to the child to go back to T helper cell 1. Without that, they stay in T helper cell 2 too long and then get exposed to these allergens that under normal situation would not cause any response. But in this situation, it uh, causes a uh, uh, hypersensitivity allergic responses so i want people to understand that that the idea of protecting the child uh from all these infections is actually counterproductive to the development of the immune system it requires the infection to move forward and if there are some of us out there like my age uh who are older people uh and recognize look how healthy we are and we didn't get all the damn vaccines, and we played in the dirt, and we we were just covered with environment. And I go, that was one of the most powerful influences in creating a strong immune system. The hygiene hypothesis reveals that the cleanliness, that we want to make sure everything is sterile and clean for the baby, is actually preventing the normal development of that immune system. So we'll... We'll eliminate that phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, it's certainly next to having a problem in your immune system. (laughs) Bruce, it's been wonderful having you in here, and you've covered a wide variety of topics as well as covering the vaccinations. And it's been really great having you here. Thank you, Bruce. I so much appreciate this, Lisa. And and thank all of you listeners out there. Thank you for letting me be part of this wonderful country. Thank you. That was me, Lisa Eyre, interviewing Dr. Bruce Lipton, scientist and biologist extraordinaire. And this interview was sponsored by the Awareness Party. You've been listening to Green Planet on Planet FM. Join us at the same time next week, 8 a.m. Thursdays, or any time online at greenplanetfm.com. I invite you to be able to come to greenplanetfm.com where we have over 400 interviews in our database which you can readily download and listen to to be able to inspire yourself to become the change you want to see in the world and become involved in caring for your children and grandchildren's future. We are also on Facebook, on Green Planet FM and OurPlanet.org. Please come and love us. This is Tim Lynch. And or Lisa Eyre. And Liz Gunn. In the spirit of Aroha, wishing you a wonderful week. We look forward to being with you next week. I say kia kaha and hairi rā.